Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about an X-ray view of massive stars, black holes, and neutron stars. Uh, so I want to start off by wishing a happy 25th birthday to the Chandra X-ray Observatory, uh, our you know guest of honor tonight. And here's a you know nice picture of it. It's a space-based telescope, so it's a satellite, um, and it is observing at X-ray wavelengths. So yeah, happy birthday, Chandra! It's an X-ray observatory. So I want to just take us to the very first step here. What are X-rays? So you might think of X-rays as something you get at the doctor or something you get at the dentist. Perhaps you think about x-rays with your favorite superhero with x-ray vision looking through to see the bones of something underneath. And both of these things are kind of hinting at the fact that x-rays are very high energy and very kind of powerful. X-rays are actually just a type of what we like to call electromagnetic radiation, which is just a very physics-y way of saying light. So x-rays are just really high energy light. And I'm going to do a little bit of an astronomy 101 here. Uh, so this electromagnetic radiation is just light of different energies. And we can basically organize this into this, what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. And so part of this, kind of highlighted in the middle here with the little rainbow, is visible light, which is the part we can see with our own eyeballs. And then there's other types of light, like infrared, microwaves, and radio that are lower energy than what we can see. And then there's other types of light, like ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays that are higher energy than the light that we can see. And so today we're going to be talking a lot about x-rays, and this is just high energy light waves that are kind of, you know, floating around out there. Um, and to talk a little bit about why we use x-rays to study astrophysical objects, um, basically the idea is that the temperature of an object determines the type of light that you're going to use to observe it. So all of us sitting around here, human beings, we're all glowing right now, even though we can't see it, right? We can only see with visible light in our eyes. But if we could see in infrared wavelengths, we would see everybody's body here glowing. Maybe not that bright, because it's a bit chilly tonight. Uh, so 98 degrees Fahrenheit is human body temperature, which is 310 Kelvin, which is a temperature unit we use a lot uh, in astronomy. So again, if we were to kind of think about this in the electromagnetic spectrum, that is this kind of below the visible light energies that we can see. So if we then kind of take it away from our crowd, move up a little bit further into space, and talk about a star, the nearest star to us, the sun, is about 5700 Kelvin. Uh, and this is a picture of our sun, and the sun emits most of its light at these visible light wavelengths, which is actually not a coincidence. We basically have evolved to see visible light because the sun is our primary light source, and it emits most of its light at the visible light range. So the sun is hotter than we are, so it emits higher energy light. And then, if you go to a hotter star than the sun, so this is Zeta Ophiuchi, which is a massive star nearby the sun. It is 32,000 degrees Kelvin, so that's quite a bit hotter than the 5700 of the sun. And because it's so much hotter, it is emitting most of its energy in these higher energy light waves, a lot of it in ultraviolet. So that's the type of light that gives you sunburns. Uh, so our sun also emits ultraviolet, although it emits most of its light at visible light wavelengths. So you can kind of see we're ratcheting up in temperature here. But what if we're talking about something hotter than a massive star like Zeta Ophiuchi? What if we're talking about a black hole accretion disk? So this is a disk of material flowing into the black hole. It gets very hot as it approaches the surface of the black hole, and these disks are about 10 million degrees Kelvin. So that's quite a bit hotter. And because they are so hot, they glow in x-rays. And so we study objects that have accretion disks at x-ray wavelengths because that's the, that's the energy light -like range in which they are emitting a lot of their light. Okay, so x-rays. We're using x-rays to study accretion disks around things like black holes, things like neutron stars, and to kind of sum it up, coolish stuff. Cool is very relative in astronomy. We're like, oh, this thing is so cool, it's only 10,000 degrees. Uh, hot stuff, high energy. And because all of these different astrophysical objects are different temperatures, emitting light of different energies, we've designed this whole slew of telescopes 
uh, to detect different types of light. And one of these is Chandra, which I've kind of pointed out here, which is designed to observe light at this X-ray range of the spectrum. Okay, so I've talked about x-rays, and now I want to talk a little bit more about, well, how do I use x-rays in my research studying massive stars, black holes, and neutron stars? So first off, what is a massive star? Uh, so a star, here's a kind of cool animation. Of course, it's lagging on these screens, perhaps. But a star is just defined as a sphere of plasma, so basically a ball of hot gas, that is held together by its own gravity, so it kind of stays together in a spherical shape and it's powered by nuclear fusion in its core. You can say like a star shines under its own power. Um, and so stars are not static objects. They change throughout their lives based on essentially the availability of fuel in their cores. And what, how a star evolves depends on its mass. So the most massive stars uh, will start off kind of as a regular star, what we call a main sequence but eventually they run out of fuel, they die in this big explosion called a supernova, and then they turn into these compact objects called black holes or neutron stars. So a neutron star is basically the collapsed core of a massive star, and a black hole is when a massive star is so big that its core can't stop collapsing until it basically collapses down to an infinitely small, really dense object. Um, and we're not really going to talk about low mass stars because I don't study those in my research. They don't explode. They don't turn into black holes and neutron stars. So we're going to focus on the big guys uh, tonight. Um, so these massive stars are the ones that turn into black holes and neutron stars at the end of their lives. I'm not going to spend ages convincing you, but I'm going to tell you up front here that massive stars are important. They are the ones that explode. They basically inject a bunch of energy. They spew their guts out into the galaxies in which they reside. Uh, and so they do a lot of important stuff in terms of how galaxies and the universe itself evolves. And one thing we've learned is that massive stars are most often in a system with another star. So they're in these binary star or triple star systems. So if we had a field of massive stars, which I have shown here at these blue circles, you're actually looking at something more like this. They are gravitationally bound to another star, which, spoiler alert, can influence how they change and grow throughout their lives. Uh, because a lot of these binaries are close enough that the stars can interact at some point during their lifetimes. So I've already told you massive stars are important, but when we talk about massive stars, we are inherently talking about massive binary stars. Okay, so back to my pretty picture of stellar evolution here, again, ignoring the low mass stars. So you imagine you have two massive stars in a binary. So you must have something like this, massive star one, you know, goes through its life, boom, turns into a black hole or neutron star. Massive star two kind of does the same thing. However, we've now learned that this is not exactly what happens. We, maybe we wish it were, because that, well, maybe not, because then I'd be out of a job. Uh, so this is a little bit not what happens, and that is because of something I mentioned earlier, which is that a lot of these stars and binaries are close enough that they interact at some point during their lives. So what does that mean? So the big thing is that these stars can exchange mass. So what happens is material from one star actually flows onto the other star, so that changes the mass of the star, which then kind of influences its life, its life trajectory. It can also kind of churn up the material inside the stars, which basically gives fresh fuel uh, for fusion, so it can kind of affect how the star grows. You can even have a situation where the stars in your binary are close enough that they actually merge together and form one even more massive star, which you can imagine would be a pretty insane event and a lot of you know churning up of the star going on. One of my favorite phases in this is that you can have what's called a common envelope. So a star is made up of kind of the core, which is the densest part in the middle where fusion's going on, and then this less dense part around it called the envelope. And you can actually have one star inside of the outer layers of the other star. Uh, that can eventually lead to the two stars merging, but you can actually have a situation where the whole envelope gets shed and then you're just left with like these naked cores of your stars. Um, so this is all to say that the evolution of binary stars is complicated. This is a very complicated cartoon, uh, but just to kind of illustrate that this is not kind of that same process that I showed you before. So you start off with two massive stars, and then you can have a bunch of these phases that involve mass being transferred back and forth, 
each star can have a supernova. This one includes a common envelope, and eventually this, this scenario ends with the two stars forming neutron stars, and then those neutron stars merge together. So I want to highlight one specific phase in this evolutionary picture, which is the high mass X-ray binary phase. And this is kind of an intermediate stage. Um, and I'm highlighting this because these are the objects that I personally study uh, using observations of nearby galaxies. So a high mass X-ray binary is a point in a binary star's life where the first star has exploded and turned into a black hole or a neutron star. That black hole or neutron star, a compact object, is then accreting or basically eating material from the other star in the system, which at this point we start referring to as the companion star. Um, and you can see this disk of material, that is the accretion disk uh, that is glowing in x-rays. So we study these observationally using images of the x-ray emission coming from that accretion disk with telescopes like Chandra. And then we also want to study this, the other star in the binary system, which we have to use another telescope. Because, for example, that star I mentioned before, Zeta Ophiuchi, that was 30,000 degrees, those stars are actually not quite hot enough to be emitting a lot of x-rays, so we have to study them with other telescopes, uh, such as pictured here, the Hubble Space Telescope, which I also use a lot in my research. And so a little bit of motivation for why we care about this random intermediate phase here. You know, there's a lot of reasons besides that they're just cool and they glow in x-rays and there's black holes involved. Um, but a lot of the community is very interested in these because of the last couple stages of this evolutionary picture which I've highlighted here, a binary neutron star merger resulting in a black hole. And when two compact objects merge together, they emit what we call gravitational waves. So gravitational waves are ripples in space time, which there's a little animation here, caused when two really massive objects accelerate uh, in space time. And when they merge together, you get this kind of ripple effect moving out. So you can have two neutron stars merging, two black holes merging, a black hole or a neutron star, and all of those will result in a new black hole being formed. And ever since the first gravitational waves were detected in 2015, which is very recent, this has kind of cracked open a lot of questions in the field of astronomy and understanding the evolution of massive stars. Essentially, this is a very complicated graphic, uh, but the big idea is that we don't know how all of these black holes that we're now detecting with gravitational waves form. We think that some fraction of them form through that kind of complicated binary stellar evolution picture, which you know we are still figuring out some of the details for. We think some of them maybe form in other environments like dense clusters of stars or maybe near kind of denser regions of galaxies. But in order to answer the question of how are these systems forming, what fraction are forming in which way, we need to kind of understand each individual way that they could form. So, in my research, I focus on this binary stellar evolution formation channel, uh, which I study with these high mass X-ray binaries. So in order to study this complicated process of binary stellar evolution, I use observations of high mass X-ray binaries in nearby galaxies. So the reason I look to galaxies outside the Milky Way is that they are essentially removed from us so we can kind of get a snapshot of the whole population of these stars at once but they're also not so far away that we can't get a good crisp picture of them with our telescopes. So I've worked a lot with the Andromeda Galaxy M31 and the Triangulum Galaxy M33, which are our two kind of sister galaxies, uh, spiral galaxies to the Milky Way. And I combine X-ray observations with Chandra with optical observations taken with other telescopes. Um, and so this is a ground-based image of Andromeda, which is that uh, one of the nearby, our galaxy next door. And this is showing kind of, it's gonna rotate and then zoom, and then eventually it will actually transition to a, an image of Andromeda taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, which is actually an image that I've specifically used in my research, and just to kind of show you what the space-based images can do. So you can see we're zooming in, each of these dots is a star, and then we see all this diffuse gas uh, and basically diffuse light from a bunch of stars that we can't resolve. But when we switch to the space-based image taken with Hubble, of course the screens never do it quite justice, but you can, you can see that there's all these tiny, tiny pinpricks of light here. 
and each of those is an individual star in that galaxy that we've been able to resolve with Hubble. And so we need this combination of these X-ray observations with these optical observations to be able to look at both the black hole or neutron star and that massive star in the binary. So here is a mosaic image of that actual same Hubble image we were just zooming into of Andromeda, kind of tilted on its side. So the center of the galaxy is down below, and this is just kind of the northern disk here. Um, and if we overlay an image of the same region of the galaxy taken with Chandra, we can basically use both images together to study the black holes and these stars. So the Chandra image looks very different. It's a little grainier. You don't see kind of quite the same features you might be used to looking at when you're looking at images of galaxies. But each of these little blobs is emission coming from something hot enough to be emitting x-rays. So those could be black holes or neutron stars, really dense, uh, really hot gas, dense clusters of stars. So we use these two images together to kind of identify and study these systems. And here's a little zoom in on the Chandra image. Um, one interesting thing about astronomical images is that, you know, we can't see x-rays, as I had mentioned, they're higher energy than our eyeballs can detect. So we have to essentially map them into colors that we can see. So we basically take the energy ranges of the x-ray light and we say, okay, the, the highest energy x-ray light, we're going to color blue. The middle energy is going to be green and then the lowest energy is going to be red. And that's how we create images like this. So we kind of, again, pair these two images together, and if we want to study one individual system, we find an X-ray source, so I've kind of boxed one in here, and then we look at the optical image taken with Hubble in the same region of the galaxy. We zoom in a lot, about, I think, 400 times between this image and the one I'm about to show on the next slide, and you end up being able to look at one individual X-ray binary. So on the left here is an image taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, and again, each of these little dots is an individual star. Here is our massive star, so a star kind of like that Zeta Ophiuchi star that I uh, mentioned before. And then on the right is our slightly underwhelming, perhaps, X-ray image. <laughs> if you're used to looking at Hubble, X-ray images don't, you know, they don't look quite the same, but they are still very exciting. Uh, and so what we're seeing here is an image taken in X-rays. These are actual X-ray photons, so individual light particles detected with our with the Chandra Space Telescope of a black hole or neutron star, we're actually not sure which, uh, accretion disk. And so we can then kind of see, what we, actually, what we actually end up doing here is that this circle is on the right hand side is the position that we calculate for our source. And then that's what we have overlaid on the optical image, which is actually how we find the companion star. And this is kind of highlighting why Chandra itself is such a powerful instrument. Um, it has really high resolution compared to a lot of other X-ray telescopes which is the only reason we can actually do stuff like this. Because with a lot of other X-ray telescopes, that circle would be like as big as this whole right side of the screen, and it would be very difficult to narrow down the specific star that is actually in a binary with that compact object. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up here, and then I would be happy to take uh, more questions. So first, all, first of all, I wanted to kind of reiterate that we need X-rays to observe high-energy phenomena, things like black holes and neutron stars, because those objects are emitting most of their light at those really high energy X-ray wavelengths. Hopefully I gave you at least some inclination that massive binary stars are cool uh, and that their evolution is super complicated and we're still figuring it out. Um, and also the observations of high mass X-ray binaries, which are again that kind of middle point in this massive binary stellar evolution process, with telescopes like Chandra can help us kind of deepen our understanding of this process of massive binary stellar evolution. Um, so thank you all so much for listening. I am happy to take questions. Thank you.